Hey, good morning, Cliffwood friends. It's Mr. Van Horn here. It's um, it's Tuesday. It's April 7th. Um, it is an absolutely beautiful day. So I hope you get outside today, get some fresh air for sure. Um, you might be able to tell that I'm not at home. I'm actually at the school. I'm in my office today. I'm just checking on the school. Um, myself and a couple of teachers, we are we're coming into the building today and we're just getting some materials that we need so that we can continue our instruction, continue our learning from home. So um, it made me it made me happy. I came in, I saw a bunch of pictures, a bunch of notes that I keep on my bulletin board over there um, that you guys have given me over the years and, and whatnot and um, made me think of you, made me miss you. And um, I can't wait until we're all back together here at school. So um, stay safe, stay healthy, stay Cliffwood proud for sure. And um, we're gonna we're gonna continue with uh, Runaway Ralph here. Um, we're doing chapter eight today. Ralph strikes a bargain. All right. So I hope you enjoy. Lana was the one who discovered that Ralph was missing. The morning after Ralph's escape, she came running ahead of Aunt Jill to the craft shop. She stopped short when she looked through the screen door and saw the litter of nails, seeds, and plastic strewn about on the work table and on the floor. Aunt Jill, Aunt Jill, she shrieked, even though Aunt Jill was be directly behind her. Burglars have been here, and somebody stole Garf's mouse. Ralph crouched out of sight behind a fluff of dust in the angle where the brace joined the study. He heard campers coming. Garf, Garf, called Lana. Your mouse is gone. Somebody stole your mouse. Hey, look at the mess, said Pete. The mouse cage is all bent, observed Garf. A thief wouldn't have had to bend the cage to open it. First a watch, now a mouse, said another camper. A thief in our midst, cried Lana, eager for excitement and mystery. All right, boys and girls, let's pick up the nails and seeds and roll up this plastic. Aunt Jill's voice was calm. This crisis was not the first she had met at Happy Acres, nor would it be the last. Then Ralph heard Garf's voice saying, look at that hole in the screen door. It's big enough for a cat to squeeze through. Good thinking, Garf, said Ralph to himself. He had picked up this phrase from the many school teachers who had stayed at the Mountain View Inn while on their summer vacations. I'll bet Katzo got the mouse, said Garf, adding sadly, and he was such a good mouse too. Ralph could not help being pleased by this compliment and a little sad too. Of course he was a good mouse. He had known that fact all along, but hearing himself spoken of in the past made him feel sad that the world would have been a sadder place without him. Garf, you're a good detective, said Aunt Jill. Katzo must be the guilty one. Aunt Jill, you don't think Katzo ate the mouse, do you? Lana was awed by the enormity of such a crime. I hope not for Garf's sake, said Aunt Jill. What about my sake, thought Ralph indignantly. We'd better look around, said Aunt Jill. Perhaps the mouse is hiding someplace. Instantly, a mouse hunt was organized. Butterfly nets were seized, jars and boxes moved, craft materials lifted. Here, mousy, mousy, called Lana. Here, mousy, mousy. As if I would come running, thought Ralph, huddled behind a dusty cobweb in the dark shadows. I guess he's gone, said Garf at last, the first and probably the last mouse I'll ever have. Garf, I'm putting you in charge of repairing the hole, said Aunt Jill. Get a piece of screen and some wire from Uncle Steve, and we'll make sure Katzo won't come in here again. We wouldn't want him to annoy Chum. At that point, the fur along Ralph's spine began to tingle. There's Katzo now, cried Lana. Ralph felt the slam of the screen door jar the building as Lana ran out. Bad cat, Katzo. Bad cat, he heard her shout. Here's a picture of Ralph hiding. See right there. The scolding did Ralph's heart good. Later that morning after his riding lesson, Garf returned with a piece of screen and some wire to repair the hole. His work was frequently frequently interrupted as campers left the craft shop and drifted off to other activities. When Aunt Jill left, Ralph came down from his hiding place in a series of leaps. Through the screen door, he watched Garf sitting on the step weaving the wire patch to the screen with a piece of thin wire before he said, 
Say, Garf, about my motorcycle. Startled, Garf looked up from his work. You're alive. His obvious pleasure was most gratifying to Ralph. I thought Katzo got you. How come you believe Katzo got me when you wouldn't believe Katzo stole the watch? Demanded Ralph. I can run and jump, you know, and a watch can't. It just isn't logical for a cat to steal a watch, Garf insisted. If I show you where the watch is, will you believe me? Asked Ralph. With a look of interest, Garf sat back down on his heels. However, he said, I don't want to have anything to do with that watch. I don't want to be seen near it, or people will start saying that I took it again. Most everyone's forgotten about it, and I want to keep it that way. You don't have to go near it, said, watch, said Ralph. Just watch me. Flattening himself, he squeezed under the screen door, jumped down the steps, and ran out into the bamboo leaves. Suddenly, all bamboo leaves looked alike. Which leaf was hiding the watch? Ralph did not know. He looked under one leaf, and then the next. He heard Garf mutter, huh, and returned to his work. Over by one of the lodges, Lana shouted, bad cat, bad cat. Ralph pushed some leaves aside and crawled under others. Where was that watch anyway? There was no telling how many leaves had fallen since Katso had dropped the watch. Ralph crawled deeper and deeper into the leaves and was finally rewarded by the touch of metal against his paw. Next, Ralph grasped the buckle on the leather strap and tugged. The watch was heavier than he had expected, but it slid across the smooth inside surface of the leaf. Ralph waded up through the leaves, pulling with all his strength, and at last emerged, dragging the watch behind him. See, he said, I told you I knew where it was. Well, what do you know? Garf sat down on the step next to the craft shop. You really did. How did the watch get there? I told you, said Ralph impatiently. Katzo picked it up in his mouth, carried it out here, batted it around a while, and finally dropped it where it slid under a leaf. You know, I believe you're telling the truth, said Garf with wonder in his voice. Of course I'm telling the truth, Ralph was indignant. But what good does it do me, asked Garf. You know I can't return it. And if I said Katzo stole it, people would laugh. This moment was the one Ralph had been waiting for. First, he pulled some bamboo leaves over the watch to hide it before he faced Garf. All right, let's talk business, he said. I return the watch and clear your name. You give back my motorcycle. From the trampoline, Ralph heard Lana say as she bounced, Bad dog, Sam. You're supposed to be a watchdog. She stopped bouncing and began to scold Sam. You're a watchdog. Why didn't you watch what Katzo was doing? Why did you let Katzo get that poor little mouse? Garf thought a while before he said, Why do you want the motorcycle? The ground is pretty uneven around here. Why do you want it, countered Ralph. You're too big to ride it. It is mouse-sized, not boy-sized. I want it because I like to think about motorcycles, said Garf. I push it back and forth and think about riding the motorcycle when I grow up. I want to ride it, said Ralph. Now, back to the Mountain View Inn. I want to go home. The Mountain View Inn? Garf was incredulous. That's over a mile away. You'd never make it. Ralph recalled the long and thrilling downhill ride. He remembered how he, would, how he had thought at the time that he would never be able to get back up that mountain road. Maybe you're right, he admitted. Of course you wouldn't, said Garf. He pulled the motorcycle out of his pocket and ran a finger over the front tire. For one thing, your tires would never stand the trip. They're wearing smooth. There is still a lot of mileage left in them, if you ride on floors, but they won't hold up on a highway. Oh, Ralph had not considered the possibility of his tires wearing out. And another thing, said Garf, you'd probably get laryngitis from making a motorcycle noise before you were halfway there. Ralph was utterly dejected. I suppose you're right. Bad Sam, bad Sam, scolded Lana from the trampoline. Ralph ducked under a leaf while some campers walked by. What am I going to do, he asked pitifully as he emerged. I can't stay here with the cats. I'm a hotel mouse. I'm not used to living on weed seeds out in the cold. 
When winter comes, I'll probably die if the cats don't get me first. I've got to try to make it back to the hotel. You should have thought about things like that before you ran away, chided Garf. I should, but I didn't, said Ralph coldly. You don't have to sound like a grown-up. Sorry, apologized Garf. The dinner bell rang and campers began to run toward the dinner hall. Katso, avoiding Lana with a haunted look on his furry face, darted from one hiding place to the next on his way to the kitchen door. Poor old Sam, so conscientious and anxious to please, padded dejectedly across the grass with his tail drooping. He had failed in his duty. Ralph did not have much time. Do we have an agreement or don't we? He demanded of the boy. I have a better idea, said Garth. I'll take you back to the hotel myself when my family comes to get me. They'll be spending the night there before they come pick me up the day after tomorrow. The camp doesn't serve us lunch on the day we leave, so I know we'll stop at the inn for lunch before we start home. It's the only place around here, and I could easily take you along in my pocket. This offer was more than Ralph had hoped for. But the motorcycle, he persisted. If I return the watch, will you give it back? Ralph felt he would rather perish at Happy Acres Camp than return to the hotel without his motorcycle. How will you return it? Ralph was curious. You couldn't get it up on the shelf in the craft shop or up on a desk in the office. I didn't say where I would return it, answered Ralph. I said I would return it. I'll leave it somewhere where Karen is sure to find it. Garf thought this plan over, but people might think I left it there. Ralph had an answer. Not if I leave it someplace where the boys can't go. You mean the girls' bathroom, asked Garf, visibly impressed by Ralph's idea. Maybe, said Ralph carelessly, or Karen's lodge, or the girls' dressing room by the swimming pool. You'd better make your mind up or you'll be late for lunch. It's a deal, said Ralph suddenly. You return the watch by tomorrow and I'll give you back your motorcycle. The next day I'll take you to the inn. But remember, no watch, no motorcycle. It's a deal, agreed Ralph, and you might throw in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for my dinner. Would you care to shake on it? Asked Garf. Ralph extended his paw, which Garf took gently between his thumb and forefinger. They shook. I'll meet you by the bamboo tomorrow morning after breakfast, said Garf, and he ran off toward the dining hall. If you're not there, I'll come back later. I hope I'll be there, thought Ralph, who knew a night of peril lay ahead of him. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich would help give him strength and courage. Over in the dining hall, the campers began to sing. You can't go to heaven on roller skates because you'll roll right past those pearly gates. You can't go to heaven with a nickel in your jeans because the Lord don't allow no slot machines. And that's the end of chapter eight. And we'll pick up with chapter nine, a dangerous plan tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody.